Good morning. My name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. And the uh, project uh, in the Cincinnati, Southern Ohio area is uh, directed by Brian Powers from the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And today is March the 14th, 2022, and we're here at the home of Harold Brown, 4730 East Marshview Drive in Port Clinton, Ohio. Mr. Brown, thank you very much for My giving pleasure. us this interview. Uh, <clears throat> before we start on your military career, I'm going to ask about your background, and you've probably been interviewed a number of times because of oh, your... Just a few times. <laughs> because of your <laughs> great history. You, so what is your full name, Harold? Harold Haywood Brown. And what's your birth date, Harold? Do you mind if I call you Harold, or do you want Mr. No, Brown? No, you just call me anything <laughs> you like. Well, my birthday is August the 19th, and I'm almost ashamed to tell you, 1924. All right, so you're going to be 98 very soon. Well, I got about another six and a half months to go up to August. Yep. Well, I was born yes. in August myself, August 24th. But I'm not You're the 24th, right. mine's the 19th. Correct. And where were you born, young man? In uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. What were your mom and dad's names? My mother is, was Ollie Mae Brown, and uh, my father was uh, John Alexander Brown. What was your mom's maiden name before she married John? Well, I always Remember? have to think about that. And I always wind up forgetting it. Okay. That's <laughs> that happened so long ago. <laughs> so what in the world was my... Huh? And right now, I'm drawing a blank. Well, I can't even tell you what her maiden name was. Well, if you remember it as we go along, do you well, just... That is pretty pop. sad. Uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I have uh, one brother five years, my, my senior, <coughs> excuse me, I have to sip a little sip of water here. <coughs> okay. I've, I've been coffee here recently. You take your time. I thought we had it under control. Okay, and my brother was Lawrence Alexander Brown. He was five years my senior, but he passed uh, about five years ago. Um, was he married? <clears throat> oh yes, he was married. His uh, wife uh, still up in Minneapolis. Uh, they had two children, and uh, then the. Uh, Kids had uh, four children, so they had uh, four grandchildren. Okay. So, what what kind of work did your dad do? What John do? Oh, well, John was a labor. He was with the Archie Daniels Linseed Oil Company. Uh, they were out of New York and came to Minneapolis, and uh, they were in Minneapolis for a number of years, and. Uh, he went to work with them. Uh, uh, he started off as a pressman. They would have these large bales of seed that they would press the lens, uh, the linseed oil out of. Okay. And uh, he did that for several years, and then they moved him up to foreman of, uh, which was quite a promotion for him. And he stayed there, of course, until he was 65, uh, and he had to retire and uh, broke his heart. Oh, it was mandatory retirement? Well, then the company had one at 65. Oh, boy. And it broke his heart. And uh, he lived until he was 
two weeks prior to his 95th birthday <laughs> before he passed. So what did he do between retirement and Well, he didn't do much of anything. He and Ma, uh, we lived up north, uh, or we moved up north on Lake Sullivan, um, right off of Lake Sullivan, really. And that was one of their favorite fishing spots. Of course, you know, Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. Sure. But uh, fishing was a very popular sport up in Minnesota. And my dad went fishing almost every other day or so. And that's about all they did and except to live up on the farm and uh, go out and fish and then eat fish. <laughs> and so you lived on a farm? Yes, the farm where we had, uh, we were down in Minneapolis, but when we relocated, uh, let me back up just a bit. Uh, we lived in Minneapolis until my brother and I, we were grown and they stayed there for about an additional 15 years, 20 years, and uh, then they located up north, so 200 miles north of uh, Minneapolis, uh, and they uh, bought a farm up there. How big was their farm? 200 acres. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting uh, because uh, the road uh, from uh, the little dirt road to get back up to the house, was almost a quarter of a mile. Uh -huh. And uh, the farmer who was uh, next door said, well, I'll tell you what, Mrs. Brown, I will keep your driveway nice and plowed in the winter time <laughs> if you allow me to use your 200 acres since you aren't farming it. Well, that was And nice. they were not farming it at all. It was just there. So she said, well, fine, it's just sitting there. and." Help yourself. So that worked out well. It worked out well. Sure, up up, up in that uh, neck of the woods. They uh, have winter a lot time. Of snow. Winter time was a tough time. That's right. They were up in uh, Aiken, Aiken, Minnesota, and they were just about 11 miles outside of Aiken, Minnesota. All right. So uh, <clears throat> where where did you go to grade school? Well, I went. Uh, I was uh, in Minneapolis. Blaine School uh, was from uh, K through six. Then after you got through the sixth grade, uh, you then went to Sumner School, S-U-M-N-E-R. And they went from uh, the sixth grade all the way up, uh, all the way up to the ninth grade. <laughs> And then you went to high school, uh, and it went from 9 to 12, and that was North High School. And those were all in uh, Minneapolis? They were all in Minneapolis, Were yep. they all integrated? Oh, yes, back in the... No, I mean, yes, the schools were all integrated Okay. up in Minneapolis. And I kind of forget that it was a little different up in Minneapolis than the rest of the part of the country when I was growing up. And... Uh, so the whole city, everything was pretty much integrated and you just come and go almost any place that you wanted to. Good. And if you could afford one of the big beautiful houses and some of the other districts, they would sell it to you. However, no one could afford it, so no one <laughs> moved out of their own little, you know, district. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, did your brother, go through the same school system that you did? He did. And did both of you graduate from uh, yes, high school? Yes, we both graduated from North High School. And what what did uh, Lawrence do when he graduated? Well, let me think. Uh, for the first a few years, uh, he started the college, left college after a year or so, went out to California, then uh, the war started. And Dad called them and said, Lawrence, you better get back here because uh, the draft is sending a lot of letters here to the house. And uh, so he came back from California to Minnesota. And uh, he, got, he came home just about two months before June of 1942, roughly, 
because he was uh, drafted in June of 1942, and that was the year that I graduated from high school. And uh, went into the war, he and his dear friend Earl Miller, and they were the very best of friends. Uh, was he in the Army? They were in the Army. All right. And then, you know, uh, there was no United States Air Force Correct. back in those days, it was the Army Air Corps. But he wasn't in it, he was in the military anyway. But uh, his job in the military, uh, they had a support group that was primarily ammo outfit. And it was their job to take the ammo and distribute it to all of those who needed it. And they would come in large trucks and just take large amounts of it, you know, and take it out into the field where the men were fighting. Now, was he in the was he in the European theater or was he in yes, Pacific? he was in the European theater. Where did he spend most of his time in? Well, France they or were Germany stationed or? in. The, well, they first went to uh, North Africa for a short while, and then from there. They wound up uh, in uh, Sicily. As a matter of fact, uh, if you remember, it was uh, the, the general they called the Desert Fox. What in the world was his name? Edmund Rummel. Well, Rummel was the bad guy, right. the German. He was a Desert Fox. Uh, the, uh, the good guy, uh, oh, what in the world? I can't think of the general's name, but he was over the Fifth Army. Okay. And uh, the Fifth Army fought in North Africa, and then from there over the Sicily, and from Sicily into Italy, and then went north to Italy, all the way up almost to the Po Valley, which was just up on the northern side of Italy uh, before you crossed over the border into that southern part of Europe. And uh, and my brother, of course, they followed the army all the way up. Sure. And his uh, last station was just south of uh, the Po Valley, uh, is where his outfit was stationed. And uh, my brother and I, we just didn't get along with each other, <laughs> you know. Well, it he's an, old, always, he's an older brother. If you, if you have to go, you, you have to take you have to take care of Ma. Do I have to be bothered with him? Yes, you have to take him <laughs> if you want to go. Well, all right, come along. And Ma, do I have to go with him? Yes, you got to go with your older brother. <laughs> so there was this constant riff. Uh, if we were going someplace, and we went very few places, and that allowed me to not go through this big hassle of having to go with him, <laughs> and he didn't have to be bothered with me. So uh, uh, that was the way it was, you know. And my big brother, I just hated his guts. And he was up in northern Italy when I went overseas, and I was down in southern Italy at Ramatelli, which is where our air base was stationed at. Uh, Ramatelli was, if you think of Naples, Italy, it's almost due east over to the other side, to the Adriatic side of Italy. And that's where uh, our air base was. And- uh, Well, when, and, when, did, uh, when did your brother get out? Did he uh, serve until the end of the war? Well, he was on his way he, he went into the military early, in June 1942, and uh, they were overseas six months later. And uh, he came down to see me. Matter of fact, we never wrote to each other. We never made contact with each other. But uh, a very dear friend of his, a matter of fact, well, a very, this one very dear friend of his, he was in the outfit that I was in, the 332nd Fighter Group, and he was a captain. He wasn't a pilot, but he's a ground officer, and he handled all the munitions and whatnot. And uh, they kept in touch with each other. 
and they were writing each other. And uh, one day in February of 1945, he wrote him and said, hey, I can get a few weeks off. I'm going to come down and visit. Well, on his way down, the truck goes off of a bridge. Ooh. Twelve guys in the back, four of them were killed. Oh. Eight of them were, four of them were badly injured and four of them walked away from it. And uh, my brother was four that was badly injured, matter of fact, and the uh, truck was in a creek. And to keep from drowning, he talked about how he was taking the sediment and whatnot from the little creek bed and propping his head up to keep from drowning. Uh, but he was very badly injured. Uh, and, uh, and the interesting thing about that uh, is that that happened on uh, February. It was the week before the end of February. And right around, actually, well, it was, no, it was a little closer to the 28th of February because two weeks later, on the 14th of February, is when I got shot down. So the folks first get the message that your son was badly injured and whatnot, uh, you know, and uh, they sent him home. And then two weeks later, after that, they get another <laughs> telegram from you know, the War Department, your son. It, Harold H. Brown is missing in action. Oh, wow. That's all it was, you know, nothing else. And, uh, and that's what happened to us, of course, during wartime. Well, I bet your mother and uh, dad just about fell apart. Well, it was kind of tough on them, to say the least. And, uh, of course, you know, when the, when the war ended, uh, I came home uh, well, I was a POW, and POWs and people who had been hurt and otherwise, they had the highest priority on the ships. So uh, I was liberated by uh, Patton. Well, I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, get I'll into, get into that, that later, a little bit then. later. Okay. Let's, let's, let's get you out of high school. <laughs> and, and <laughs> okay, when, and when you're so we all graduated from North High School. And how long was it before you got drafted? Or did you enlist? Well, I graduated on June the 17th, and I always wanted to fly anyway. But in North High School, we had a small flying club. Oh. And we had about uh, oh, 12, 15 of the kids were in it. Well, the war had just started, you know. And, uh, well, as you know, in 1941, December the 8th, when uh, Roosevelt announced after they had bombed us on December the 7th yeah. that we were going to war. And uh, <clears throat> So did you get to fly some in that little high school flying club? Oh, no. As a matter of fact, we didn't have any aircraft to fly. Okay. We just had a flying club, you know. We made models and we talked about flying and, and did those kinds of activities. Uh, <clears throat> but. I graduated on in June. That was the year that Bubba uh, went to war. In June '42, I graduated from high school, 17 years old, and uh, immediately went down and applied for flight training. And I set for the exams and was fortunate enough to pass the mental exams, then the physical exams. And at that point, I had to then wait for an assignment for flight school. Now, we were only training one group of pilots that looked like me down in Tuskegee right, Institute. Right. And uh, they had just finished building Tuskegee Army Airfield. Uh, well, they had just finished it just shortly before I finished high school. <clears throat> So well, the government powers that be didn't think you guys were oh, capable of <clears throat> flying. Well, that was very interesting. You know, the big argument started in 1939. They came up with a program called Civilian Pilot Training Program. 
and uh, someone thought, and it only went into 200 colleges. And uh, the one legislature, he was in the uh, he was in the house, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was out in Idaho, as best as I can remember. And uh, he came up with an amendment to the bill. And they amended the bill to include six predominantly black colleges um, and the 200 colleges that had this program of I just call the program uh, flight training for civilians. Okay. And and that program started up, and as a matter of fact, that went on for two years, from 1939 until 1941, and Roosevelt got sick and tired of it. In March of 19, uh, March 21st, 1941, is when he said, that's it. We're going to have one squadron, and that's what started the whole thing. And from that point on, you know, down at uh, Tuskegee Institute got the contract. Well, didn't maybe uh, Eisenhower come down to Tuskegee and yes, she fly with you guys? There. However, she came down there just after Roosevelt announced that they were going to start training them okay. on March the 21st. And they began building Tuskegee Army Airfield. And of course it took, oh, something less than a year, something like seven, eight months to build the field just about eight miles north of Tuskegee Institute. Right. And she came down uh, just around that time when the field was just about completed. As a matter of fact, uh, she rode with, uh, with uh, the chief pilot in primary school. You, I mentioned, you know, they started this program of civilian pilot training program. Yes. And they put it in the six black colleges, was amongst the 200. Well, graduates out of that program could apply for advanced training, which a number of them did. So when they started up Tuskegee Institute and they started flying, they went back to people who had been trained in that program and they brought them down and they went through a special Air Force program to become civilian primary flight instructors. And they became our primary instructors and that occurred over at Moton Field, which was right a few miles west, a few miles east of the institution, Tuskegee Institute. Uh -huh. And that's where they only did primary there. Now, were those instructors white or black? Or? No, no, they were all black. Okay. And, uh, and, and, uh, like I said, they had six schools who was participating in the civilian pilot training program. Right. But they're out of the 200 schools. And the idea was to send pilots to the 200 schools so that they could then go through the whole flight training program to become pilots, military pilots, in one half the period of time. Now, at that time, they were just starting to let guys like uh, like me go into it. So when they needed primary instructors, they went to graduates okay. of that pilot training program and brought a number of those guys down, or you could volunteer, however it was, but they brought some 24 guys from the various black colleges who had gone through the program, uh -huh. and they brought them down as primary instructors. But, but that was, you know, at a later time when they started training a number of them. So the decision, like I said, was made in 1941. I graduated from high school in 1942 and at that time the first 
black pilots started training in July of 1941. And that was when the first class started. That was before uh, the, the airfield was even uh, completed. Okay. And they had to get their f flight training down in Maxville Air Force Base because they were just building Tuskegee Army Airfield, mm. but it was not built by the time the first class finished. So the first class started in July of 1941. They graduated in, uh, in April, I believe 42. it was April 1942. It was approximately seven, six, seven months long or something like that. So how long did you have to train before you actually got to fly a, a plane? Okay, uh, when I applied for uh, training after graduating from high school, which was in, of course, June of 1942. I went home, and but the, all of my paperwork had to go to Washington, D.C. All of the other guys that were sitting there, there was about 100 of us, and I was the only black one there. Everyone who passed it was immediately put in a special category waiting for a slot to open up for flight training. Everyone but me. My paperwork had to go to Washington, D.C., where the selection was made at the War Department. Who was going to go in to Tuskegee? Yeah. Guys like me, again. Yeah. Because they had, initially, they had thousands of like guys who immediately applied for it, who were, some of them were even college graduates who immediately fly, applied for flight training to go down to Tuskegee. How I was selected, I call it nothing but pure, unadulterated luck. Because I heard I was nothing but a little snotty-nosed 17-year-old <laughs> kid, fresh out of high school, and I applied for the training I was selected, and the rest was really history. But when you stop and think about it, there were, they were running out of the guys that had college training, particularly amongst the black guys. Yeah, there were a few, but not very many. So they dropped the whole restriction on you had to be a college graduate to go into flight training. They said, we'll take high school graduates if they can pass the mental and physical exam. And they had made that announcement before I graduated. So that's why as soon as I graduated, I immediately went down to set for the exam. Now, where did you have to test for the exam? Was that Minneapolis? This was down, or? Yeah, this was in Minneapolis okay. at the regular recruitment office okay. that was doing all of the recruitment. All right. And I had to go down there to set for the exam. Were they kind of surprised at the uh, at the recruiting station that you wanted to be in that program? Well, if they were, they didn't tell me about it. But it was interesting. There was 105 of us. I remember that number so well. That went down to take that mental, that that exam, and uh, a good number of us were nothing but high school graduates. There were also a number of freshmen from the University of Minnesota that came in, you know, uh -huh. to apply the same time that we did. And they sat, you know, in the same place, but they had to still take the same exams that I took since they weren't college graduates. And the opportunity came for those guys to go in, because there was a, they weren't graduating college graduates that fast, and they needed pilots in a hurry, mm -hmm. and they were in a big rush to get them. And this is why they opened up the whole program, and they even included one outfit, one group of black pilots, and uh, 
And I used to keep track of all this stuff because I was delivering the uh, 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 colored uh, weekly paper. They had a cup, two of them. One, well, they had several, but the more popular ones was the Chicago Defender. I remember it quite well. The uh, they had one up in Cleveland. I can't remember what it was called. It was the Cleveland something or other. But I was selling all those weekly papers. And the Pittsburgh Courier, which was perhaps the biggest one, was keeping track of all this stuff. And every week they would have an article of, on the status of it. And that started from the time that they first started these, the program I mentioned, the Civilian Pilot Training uh -huh, Program. Uh -huh. That program. Uh, Roosevelt went on March the 21st when he approved it. That was a big article on March the 21st, 1941. That was a big article in the Pittsburgh Current. I remember reading it and I said, boy, they finally, they, they're finally going to train us. Because the guys, they used to tease me. They said, what are you going to do here? I said, hey, I'm going to become a pilot. And they used to tease me with, Harold, they won't even let you wash that an airplane, <laughs> let alone fly one. And uh, and I can recall so well when I, you know, graduated from high school, I immediately went running down and, you know, to set for the exams and stuff. Only they sent my paperwork to Washington, D.C. I wasn't fortunate enough after I passed everything to be included. Right away, right. No, uh-uh. Do you remember what, what date it was that you got notification that you oh, were accepted? I remember it so well. Not the date, but it was in December of, 19, uh, of 1942, six months after I had... Uh, after you graduated high school? Yeah. And uh, it was in the latter part of December, and I was becoming a little worried about it uh, because the guys at my age, I had turned 18 that August. And guys my age were being drafted in the military left to right. And I wasn't protected. All of the other guys who sat and passed their exams, they were protected. So you could have been a, oh, a ground pounder instead of being... I, I could have. Uh -huh. And I was just out there, you know, hoping that I would be selected up in Washington, D.C. Well, when did you get down to Tuskegee? Well, they notified me in December that I had been selected, and they sent me a letter, and the letter had instructions. And the instructions was for me to go out to uh, Fort Snelling, which was, uh, well, Fort Snelling was a very large base, and, well, you wouldn't know if I, I, it was over on the Minneapolis side, it's interesting, because I took Marsha out there uh, when we were up in Minneapolis uh, uh, just this past year. And I took her out, you know, just to show her Where Fort Snelling. Been? But nevertheless, I'm getting off the story. But I went out to Fort Snelling, and uh, my instructions was to go to Fort Snelling, give them the letter, they would induct you into the military, and Fort Snelling was instructed in the letter that I was to be inducted into the military and whatnot and sent down to, to Tuskegee. That had to be a good day in your life. Oh, it was just, oh, you know, it's something that this is, I had just sweated on. and. What kind of planes did you train in uh, down in Tuskegee? Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, they had another base down in, uh, let me think of the name of it. It essentially started getting old. These are names that, that would just pop up my head immediately, <laughs> and now I got to think about them for a short while. Because uh, this is where they sent all of the guys initially, and it was down in, uh, <laughs> I was hoping it would come to me. I'm certain that it will as I keep talking. But that base was not Tuskegee. It was down in Biloxi, Mississippi. Okay. And uh, 
there was they had a huge training base down there, and this is where they sent numerous guys, and all of us guys went down there, plus many others. But we went there, and this was all part of it, and you went there for your basic training. And from there, you would go from Lexington, Mississippi, up to Tuskegee. And after you got to Tuskegee, there is where you became an aviation cadet, and you were now within the training program. Okay. But uh, I was down in Biloxi uh, for approximately six weeks or so, you know, for just basic training. Then I went up to Tuskegee. As a matter of fact, uh, they notified me in uh, the December. Like I said, I got the original letter in December, went over, was inducted into the military in January, about two to three weeks. Uh, they then sent me down to Biloxi. I was in Biloxi, Mississippi for just about six, seven weeks until sometime around March or early April of, 19, of 1943. 43. Okay. And, and then from there, I went up to uh, Tuskegee Institute. Now, at Tuskegee Institute, were they just training the, bl the black pilots there? Or did they have some w white? No, it was all black. And the instructors were all black? Right. Now, the primary instructors were all black. They could only train you in primary, but then for basic and advanced, you went over the Tuskegee Army Airfield, which had been completed, and there is where you got you finished up your training and you were commissioned a second lieutenant and you got your wings. But that was at Tuskegee Army Airfield, which they started building once Roosevelt said, yes, we're going to train one squadron of them back in, 19, uh, back in 1941. And that's when they started building the airfield. Right. So but now did the trainers up there at the, that airfield, were they were they white or black? They were all they were all white, did, up at the airfield. Did you experience any uh, uh, segregation up there from the white officers? No, it was interesting because uh, here they had this beautiful field, and uh, that was built to train all black pilots. A number of the officers were black who had come out of ROTC and so forth, and they had volunteered not as pilots, but just into the military. And they were down there as ground officers. So we had no black officers over at Tuskegee okay. Army Airfield. Okay. Are you getting uh, seconds and minutes on, this, on the screen? Yes, I am. Okay. All right, so... Uh, how long were you at Tuskegee uh, Airfield before you got any assignment to go overseas? Okay. The general, the, con the way the program worked, everyone went to Biloxi for approximately seven weeks, yep. then up to Tuskegee. Yep. At Tuskegee, they had a large pool of pilots who had ground training and who had been selected for training. and you were assigned a class, and when that class became available, and my class was 44E, which was, uh, uh, which started in, uh, well, it completed in May of, May 23rd of 1944. But from Tuskegee, I went over to the airfield, at the air, at the airfield, after I, I had to come back to, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I was at Tuskegee in ground school, but, I, but we then went over to the air base for a short while, back to Tuskegee for primary flight training. 
we did our flight training over at, uh, and we had black pilots which came out of the civilian pilot training program. They gave us, we got about six hours of flying time at Tuskegee. And this was not Tuskegee the city, this is now Tuskegee Institute. Oh, right. And it was their airport. It was Moulton Field, located two miles two miles north of, of the Institute. We lived on the Institute. They would take the buses up to the airfield. It had nothing but a, you know, a, a little big open field there initially, you know, plus the training aircraft, PT-17. We'd go up in the morning and so forth, get all of our flying in. We would come back down to Tuskegee Institute because that is where we were housed. Okay. It took me just about roughly two months to finish primary. Primary, all of the phases were just about 60 hours long. 60 hours in primary over at basic, which was on the air base now. And I left Tuskegee Institute, went over to the Tuskegee Army Airfield, and I lived on the base, you know, the barracks and so forth. Sure. We had a large base there. And all of the cadets then would go to the base, except for their primary training. They would go to Tuskegee Institute, live at Tuskegee, and go to Tuskegee Institute's field for primary training and then back to, to the airfield, the Army airfield, for your basic, your advance. You graduated in advance, became a second lieutenant, and then they would transition you, and you would transition you into a fighter aircraft for approximately 20 hours, and then you would leave Tuskegee, and you would go down to the field where you would now be trained as a fighter pilot. From there, the field for, for that training initially took place up at Selfridge, but was relocated. I just happened to be flying his wing that day. And uh, it was the first time, and we saw him out there and you know, the guys would tell me, okay, keep them. Let's watch them, watch them, watch them. And they would, you know, come in towards the bombers, and then sometimes they would break it off. You know, we would turn into them, or they would stop short and break off. Well, this time they came in, they came all the way, and they said, they aren't breaking off. So we went, dove down on them, they came all the way through the whole bomber formation and as we dove down on them, and they went through the bomber formation. And as they go through the bomber formation, hopefully they are trying to pick up a bomber, mm -hmm. you know, knock them off as they go through the formation right. and come out the other side. Yeah. Did they get any of that? They didn't get, not, not, a, not a one of them. Good, uh, good. But what, what, uh, they came off for close. Were, were those uh, Messerschmitts or were they Focke-Wolfs or what were they? No, the, well, well, they were primarily Messerschmitt and the Fock Wolf 190. And they had the, uh, uh, the Fock Wolf 190, and they had the, uh, the Messerschmitt, it was the Messerschmitt, what was it, the 103? I, I, I can't remember the last three numbers. But those were the two aircraft that they were primary flying at that time. It was later on, in the war, when the 45 uh, came along January of uh, 45 or so, we started seeing the ME 262. The jets? Yeah, the jets. And then they were talking about, boy, what in the world is that? And they, you know, talked about what it was, the approximate air speeds and whatnot. Well, and, did, uh, well, did you get into any air combat yourself, uh, where you're getting oh, shot yeah. at? And, 
in your shooting. Uh, yeah. Which was the most uh, dangerous of the of uh, the German planes, the uh, Focke-Wulf or the Messerschmitt? The Focke-Wulf was a little faster. The uh, uh, Messerschmitt had a cannon, didn't it? Yeah. Well, the Messerschmitt was an older aircraft, a little smaller aircraft, and wasn't as fast as the 190. The 190 had a big radial engine mm -hmm. and was and it was much faster. Well, not much, but it was faster and was just as maneuverable as the Messerschmitt was. There are some who might argue that point and say, no, I think the Messerschmitt was more maneuverable than the 190 was, but it was slower. Mm -hmm. On any of your missions, did you go over into Palesti oil fields? I missed uh, the last flight that they flew on the uh, to uh, Palesti happened just before I got there, mm -hmm. and I did not go to the plus. You know that was a really big deal, the Palesti uh, oil fields. Uh, huge oil fields and, and and that was the primary place that was they were getting all their oil uh -huh. and everything so uh what were you escorting uh b-17s b-24s or both both which which were the primary which most the b-24 as a matter of fact we only had one wing of b-17s in the 15th air force and we had, uh, it was five or six wings of B-24s, but only one wing, the fifth fighter bomb wing, were all B-17. Oh, I saw the movie about the Red Tails, and uh, did you experience any of the uh, animosity the white uh, pilots had for, for you black fellows? No, as a matter of fact, uh, they were asking for you, weren't they? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I never experienced it. I can remember going on my first uh, rest and recuperation, which was down in Naples. We had a beautiful hotel right at the bay of Naples, overlooked the bay. You looked over at the bay of Ness, and there was Mount Vesuvius. Okay. Right on the other side is a great big beautiful mountain. I mean. <laughs> And you go down, down all kinds of bars and things. Uh, you walk in the bar and it's loaded with, you know, soldiers, pilots, white, you know, pilots, black, anybody. So, so just a mob of them. And they say, hey, how you doing there? You're in three, three seconds. Hey, you guys, come up here and let me buy you a drink. <laughs> I gladly take a drink. Just as friendly. Now, within a group, there's always going to be a few that don't want to be bothered. Uh -huh. So they probably went their way, and we went ours. They didn't bother us. We didn't bother them. You know. Did but you? Uh, uh, there was certainly not everyone in that group loved us. But it just seemed to me that throughout my entire time, I had yet to have a bad experience while well, I was on R&R &R, rest and recuperation in any of the bars, any of the nightclubs, or any of the traveling that I did around Naples when I was on rest and recuperation. And on base you didn't have any trouble? Oh, no. Well, on base, of course, there were none. You know, the base was all black. Was it? Yes. Uh, did you have any interaction with the Italian people themselves? How did they treat you? Oh, yeah. Oh, great. I mean... You were their I liberators. I had one bad experience, you know, while I was there, uh, you know, before I got shot down. Uh, well, I was going to ask you, how many missions did you uh, fly before you got shot down? I went down on my 30th mission. 30? Mm-hmm. Went uh, down on my 30th. Had I not got down, most of the pilots 
that uh, came over or when I did or shortly thereafter, there was enough time for almost uh, all the other guys or all that did not get shot down that made it all the way through. They all got into the 50s, 51, 52, 53, 54. Oh. I don't think anyone had more than 54 missions. Wow. There might have been someone that got 55 in, but generally from 50 to 55. So, so assuming that I had not gotten shot down. Uh, where, where were you going when you got shot down? What was your uh, Oh, that was interesting. Objective? Uh, we were on a, a special 15th Air Force mission. There was a uh, area starting up at uh, Linz, Austria, and running about 100 miles southeast from Linz, Austria. And it was a very, very heavy traffic, a lot of locomotives and whatnot, a lot of train tracks. And uh, when we would come back home, sometimes we had a little fuel left and that became one of our favorite targets of opportunity. Usually if you had the fuel and if the bombers were okay, by that time, you could go back up north a little ways into this corridor, because there was always a lot of traffic there. Strafe the trains? Yeah, to do strictly strafing. Well, on this one mission, the 15th Air Force, and those guys, well, they weren't slick, but they were smart enough. They would see all these huge numbers of bombers and fighters going north, you know. And they could see us, heck, we're setting up anywhere from 24 to 30,000 feet. And you just see them all go up. And you see them all coming back. And those guys had, you know, sense enough to know that, yeah, it is safe for us to travel while these guys are flying a big mission up there. And they see them coming back. If anything, they would try to get up off of the railroads, uh -huh. and they had a lot of caves okay. along that whole 100-mile strip, and they used to go into the caves All right. and not even expose themselves. And, uh, and uh, we knew it, and 330s, I mean, the 15th Air Force, we knew what was going on. We knew where they were hiding and whatnot. There wasn't any question about it. So the 15th, and they knew just about what time we would take off. And it, it takes X amount of time, and they would see the big mob of airplane going up, so they knew, you know, the mission was on. And uh, so the 15th said, uh, let's surprise them. So the 15th Air Force came up with this one mission, and they gave the mission to the 332nd Fighter Group. And the 332nd Fighter Group gave the mission to the 99th Fighter Squadron. And we got up early in the morning, and we took off, and it was just barely the sun. It was just about ready to come up. It was just coming up as we took off. Because we didn't have lighting or nothing for that runway, so you couldn't do any night okay. you know, flying. So all your flying was in day hours. So we took off just as the sun came up, we could see the runway and went. Took off, and I think we had maximum effort. At that time, uh, I think we had just about 20, 21 aircraft that was flyable. You know, the rest of them were in maintenance. Uh, and uh, we took off. And they're all P-51s? Oh, yes. Uh, P-51s, everyone in the 15th Air Force fighter group, they had four fighter groups, seven. Three fighter groups were uh, P-38s, then they had four fighter groups of P-51s. Okay. And they had seven fighter groups in the 15th Air Force. So you guys are taking off in your P-51s. Yeah. Crack so we took on. off early on this mission, flew up, and uh, of course yeah. it took us just about two hours and something you know, to get up there into Germany. And what, what, what altitude are you and flying? As we got up there, we said, my God, 
So we came down, lent a hundred mile strip, so we came down here to the southern point, and what we did is we dropped off a, a flight of four here, went a little further, dropped off four, dropped off four, and again I was in the lead flight with Major Camel. And uh, we went all the way up to Linz, Austria. And you could hear the guys just howling and screaming, hey, there's one there, I just got one, this one blew up. We had a field day. <laughs> they didn't, and we just caught them. And I, I, I don't know the total number of, air, of uh, locomotives and things that we shot down, but I, I know I got uh, two locomotives that day. Um, now what, are you, what, what kind of armament do you have on your P-51? Nothing but just the normal armament around the pilot. Well, what, what was it? Now, what, what are you firing? Are you firing machine guns? Or? Oh, you're me. Oh, okay. Gun, oh, I'm sorry. I thought, okay. No. We had six fifties, three in each wing. Okay. Yeah. And how many rounds uh, are you carrying for these six fifties? I think we had a total of. Boy, you asked me that a little too fast. It was something between 400. Per gun? No, uh uh, this is for all three guns. This is why it was something in the hundreds. It was a five or six hundred rounds in each wing. Okay. And that's the total amount of, you know, ammunition that you could put in there. You know, because you only got your wing. The guns take up a whole lot of space. Yeah. There wasn't a whole lot of space for that gun belt. All right. You know. So how how high were you flying when you got up to your the point where you were going to start your run? Uh, when we were flying missions. On on this one. Okay, on this one, we we flew up to the first start point, flying up. We, were, we went up at something like 14, 15,000 feet. Okay. Flying up. We got up to the thing, and then from there, we came down to almost ground level. Okay. How many passes did you make? As a matter of fact, we, we got in probably the most passes because we dropped the wings, because we were all the way up at length, uh -huh. and then we turned around, we came back down, looking for targets that they may have had, had missed, you know, and even coming down. And then when we got all the way down to this end, we pulled up the flight of four of us, and the rest of the uh, fighters, they had finished and run out of ammunition, and they were waiting for us. So Major Camel says, Hey, look at that great big locomotive that we missed. And so he says, Camel says, come on, Brownie. You and I are going down. So he announced you know, to the rest <laughs> of the country, you guys circle, Brownie and I are going to go down and get this last one. And why is it always the last one that gets you in trouble? <laughs> Invariably, if you ever do it, Say no, don't go for the last one, because it's going to be bad news. But <laughs> well, we went in, and, and uh, we were separate, you know, we, 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 we broke down in them, and there was a reasonable amount of distance between he and I, and he went in, and I could see him shooting, I could see the smoke coming from his wing. And then I saw him break off, he said, damn it, I ran out of ammunition. And he said a worse word than that, but that's uh -huh. the nicest word. And so he pulls up and I said, I got a few bullets left, I know. So the, the thing I get, I lit that thing up just like a Christmas tree. I mean, and just as I passed over it, that's when it blew. Oh. And I went right through the whole explosion, came out of it and whatnot, and looked around, the airplane looked to be in good shape, checked the engine out, everything's fine. And uh, called and I said, hey, I got caught in the explosion, but the aircraft seems to be okay. And uh, they said, uh-uh, Harold, 
you're trailing smoke, it is not okay, oh. which I didn't know. And then about the time he got it out, then the engine instrument started acting crazy. Uh -huh. I said, oh, oh, here I go. So I tried to join up with the guys, but within another minute or two, I called Cam, I said, hey, Cam, I've had it. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the engine's about to quit on me. So they stayed with me for just about another minute. This was a short period of time yeah. from the time that I pulled up until they headed home. It was no more than four or five minutes. And I got out of the area just a little bit, just as far as I could before I had to jump. But you tried to get as far away from your area as possible. Sure for all the obvious reasons. Those people down there don't want to get shot at. <laughs> and if you come floating down in a parachute, you're in trouble. Right. So you always got out of the area. And fortunately, you know, the engine was boom, 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 you know, was just barely going and it finally just conked on me completely. And that's when I turned it over and jettisoned the canopy, pulled it the nose over and you just I just kicked the stick and and you kick the stick the nose pops up and it throws you out okay. and that's the safest and the fastest way to get out of a fighter unless nowadays you got ejections right but we didn't have ejection seats back in those days I have a red light here that says two minutes oh I'm still ticking all right so uh where, where did you where did you parachute to? Well, I went in uh, oh, some little village, and uh, it was down towards the southeast end of where we were strafing. I, I I don't even know the village name. It wasn't even I doubt if it was even on my map really. And uh, they picked me up. Really is what I should say. These soldiers did. The Germans? Yeah. Matter of fact, when I was in my chute, I landed, and I had a period of about, well, I landed, ran into the woods, got rid of my parachute, pulled out my escape kit, and looked at my map. Uh, I knew just about where I was at, and I thought if I could just evade for about eight days I can get to the Russian line because I knew approximately where I bailed out at. <clears throat> and, and no sooner I did that, it was a total of about 30 minutes or so that I was on the ground when uh, I saw two soldiers come up to up over the top of, of, of the hill that was back yonder here. <coughs> And they were uh, apparently had saw me when I was coming down in my chute because they had jumped off of their skis and I looked up there and they could see me down in the woods and they put the rifles on me and <laughs> that was the end. So how long were you a prisoner of war? Ah, uh, well. All total about uh, less than two months, almost two months. Where, where did you serve those two months? Matter of fact, uh, uh, from the time that I was picked up, it took me eight days to get to Nuremberg. A bomber crew uh, was shot down, and they picked up a few of those guys, and they threw them in, in the same jail with me. And the next day, we just started heading for Nuremberg, and we went any way that we could, right? If we could get a bus from here to here, the guy would, we would jump on a bus with, we had two guards with us. And we went by bus for a while. It took us eight days to get from where we were at just to, just to get over to Nuremberg. But we didn't have anything except, you know, local traffic and whatnot. Right. And if it was big enough, because there was 10 guys with them, 11 guys with me, was 12 of us with the two guards. And uh, 
There was a while we, 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 we traveled by bus for a while. There was one period of time where we were on a train for a short period of time. Did you ever get attacked by, uh, by friendly aircraft on these travels? As a matter of fact, not going to Nuremberg. Uh, we were at Nuremberg for two weeks. I was interrogated there over a three-day period. And then they left the interrogation center and sent me down to where the POW camp was. And they had roughly 10,000 troops there. It was a big POW camp. I was there for no more than two weeks. And of all of the luck, when they took me in the POW camp, you know, wires all around, but then inside of the camp they have compound. You know, a building, a house, a couple hundred, and some barbed wire around it, but it was separated from another building, then another building, then another building, all over this large area. The building of all the luck I went to and and all of the old prisoners, and they say, hey, they're bringing in some new prisoners, and they're all on the fence. They say, did you guys come in from the 100th fighter group with a yakky yak in there? Yak okay, uh, we had a little. Uh, Let me see. Where were we at? We had a little electronics uh, issue here, but uh, we were talking about your uh, being a prisoner of war. And, uh, <clears throat> um, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I was talking about from the time I was shot down, it took me eight days, you know, to get up to Nuremberg. Very convenient to get to Nuremberg. Uh, we were in Nuremberg, I think I said they had about 10,000 prisoners right. in Nuremberg. In the but I was interrogated. Uh, uh, well, they had the interrogation center there, and uh, <clears throat> two or three days, I told I, I was interrogated over that period of time. And they took a lot of time with airmen because the day before or the day after, they were down in England or they were down in Italy. They read the newspaper, the Stars and Stripes. They knew what was going on. <laughs> they had the latest information. So they really, really interrogated airmen, much more so than they did the ground okay. officer. Because those poor guys are you know, up there on the front lines for days and days at a time. You capture one of them, they don't know what's going on. Right. Nothing. So, uh, so, uh, so what, were you, what were you able to tell them? Just your name, rank, and serial number? That's all I did. And I'm saying for the three days that I was interrogated, Harold H. Brown, AO830783 was my number. And uh, so this guy spoke perfect English. He said, yeah, yeah, I know Harold. I know name rank. Look at that. He says, I've heard that crap, you know, for so long, you know. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to respond to them. And you know, of course, I don't give them. He says, I know all about that. I know how they briefed you, you know, before you flew your last mission. And uh, he says, now tomorrow, I'm going to ask you some of these same questions and you're going to give me the answers that I want, or I'm going to turn you over to the civilians. Uh. Well, that got my attention. That really got my attention. So I said, holy smokes, you know, now what? Next day, got back up to his office again. I was in a cell, you know, and they, a couple of guards take me from there up to where his office was. So, uh, good morning, Lieutenant Brown. Have a good night's sleep. No, sir, I didn't. And he uh, says, what? Was the bed? No, no problem. What was the problem? I wanted to tell him you were the problem, <laughs> you know, because you threatened me. I said, uh, I just didn't sleep that well. 
He says, well, he says, this is going to be easy. He says, there really isn't anything that you know that I probably don't know. So he took me around to another side of his office, and he had a whole library of these great big three-ring notebooks. And he said, and they all had numbers on He said, you recognize any of those numbers? And I looked around and said, no, I don't. He says, oh, come on, Harold. That 332, now what does that mean? <laughs> he says, you know, that's your group. And the 100, 301st, 302nd, and he had on the other books with the numbers, big blue books. I can remember them so well with white lettering was on these mags. He says, there's your whole outfit. And he says, and you were in, and you were in the 99th, weren't you? You know, I said, no, how the heck does he know that, you know? And uh, name ranks him, he says, nope, I know you were, because on the records of your aircraft, you were flying A-3-2. And they got that off of the wreckage of the aircraft. Uh. And he says, only the 99th carries the A in front of the numbers. The other three squadrons did not. And he knew that. <laughs> you know, and uh, then he started talking a little bit. And he says, oh, I forgot to tell you. He said, your intelligence officer, Captain Toppins? And I said, uh, yes. And uh, he said, well, Captain Toppins just got a promotion, the major. And I found out later on that he had was promoted at such and such a time. But he was, you know, a, the intelligence guy within the 99th Fighter Squadron. I mean, and I can easily see where if you had information, boy, they would talk to you because they could, they could talk as if they knew everything, but they didn't. But they made it appear but then I thought about it later on when I got out, you know, many years later, you know, that thing often occurred to me. And I said, <clears throat> and then I remember reading someplace where daily papers and whatnot were things that were printed in the daily papers. They were getting that news. They kept themselves updated. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of that was not but public information yeah. that was published anyway. But the very fact that he had access to that kind of information. Well, you say at this, at this uh, big uh, concentration camp, there were like 10,000 uh, military yeah. guys. Were they all Air, Air Force or were some? Oh, no. It was primarily Air Force, but they had Air Force from English, they had Australian pilots and whatnot. They had a number of Englishmen, American pilots, and I knew that those three groups of people were there, but they were primarily pilots or other crew members. Well, I've been told that the, that the Germans treated the, pilot, the, the airmen differently than they did the, the ground guys. Uh, you got a little little different treatment. I don't, well, you know, not, you know, I actually don't know. All I knew is that in ours, we were primarily flying people. Well, how was the food in the camp? They didn't have enough food to feed themselves, but the Red Cross was getting in food parcels. As a matter of fact, the International Red Cross, if it hadn't been for them, we all would have probably starved. And but the Germ Germans let that stuff through to you? Oh, yeah. They let it come through. They got their share because they didn't have anything to eat. And they were as hungry as we were. Some of those guys were. So did, did you personally share with them or their? Oh, they're, no. They're, they got their, they're they got off. their boxes and then they gave out the rest of the boxes. <laughs> They're skimming off the top, huh? That was it, exactly. <laughs> they sure did. Well, uh... And you got a variety of food. And, oh, and I was going to tell you, of all the luck, 
Who did I run into in my compound, the guy hanging on the fence, was a dear friend of mine. My classmate was one of the 15 guys that came over oh, with really? me two weeks earlier. He and one other guy went down on a mission on February the 25th. Well, did they get shot down by a plane, or did they have the same experience no, you had? One of them, uh, one of them, uh, Isles, uh, Isles was hit on a strafing mission uh, while he was strafing, but he headed out and his his airplane was still flyable. So he says, "I'm heading to Switzerland." This is nice, and that was the ideal place to be. Switzerland, wonderful hotel. But you couldn't leave. Yeah. So I, later on, I found out what he did, you know, and he was, and, and he could see where he had to go to, but he was slowly losing altitude, and he couldn't make it in his Switzerland, but he'd get awful close to it. So he bellied the aircraft in, jumped out of the airplane, and started running as fast as he could to the border. But and there were troops on the other side of the border. German troops? No, no. American? There Swiss? Were, yeah, Swiss troops. And they were saying, come on, come on. And I was screaming at them, keep running. But they would not cross that line and come into Germany. But they were over there and they were waving their money. He was running like crazy. And the Germans were chasing them. And they caught him uh. right <laughs> at the gate. Oh, gee. Uh, and he said, Harold, he says, I was that close to getting into Switzerland. <laughs> and then there he was. So he and I, and that was kind of nice. You know, and he was one of my dearest friends. And we stayed together until we were liberated. We were in the same compound together. Oh, good. Which made it. Now, you mentioned Campbell. What was his, for, what was his full name? Who was that? Campbell. Oh, oh, okay. Bill Campbell. William A. Campbell. Uh, he was born in Tuskegee. His whole family uh -huh. was uh, from Tuskegee. Have you and seen he him? Went to Tuskegee Institute. Uh, Camel went right up the ladder. He was an older guy. He was in the first 99th Fighter Squadron. And he flew a full mission with them, came home, and then volunteered to go back for a second tour of duty. But then the 99th joined the 332nd, but he was in the 99th and he became the CO. Now, was he flying with you when you got, when you uh, were knocked out uh, by the explosion of that engine that you burned up? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was on his wing yeah. again. Yeah. When he went down, shot no ammo, I said, well, move out of the way, and he pulled <laughs> off. And that's the one that I went down so on. So what, what do you think? Uh, did, you, did you hit that engine in the boiler, or what caused such a big explosion? Oh, it, was, it was right in that big engine. And, and that's what you, and that's one of the first things. If you had a, a string of cars, that's the first thing you'd do was take it, the engine out. Yeah. Then, of course, everything stopped. And when they blow, I mean, and I've seen any number of them blow up. I mean, the great big explosion. And cause the whole tank is there on the water, it's under yeah. pressure. And you really see a nice big explosion when it goes. <laughs> the only trouble is you oh, were part yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, but the, yeah, the ideal thing is hit it, get out of the way, and then let it blow up. <laughs> Don't be silly enough to come across it. And now I was low. I mean, I came across that thing because I was driving, driving on it, and it, I had it lit up just like a Christmas tree almost. Because, you know, every fifth bullet is a tracer. Uh -huh. And I could see those tracers just hitting all around the engine. Was that engine and, pulling uh, some other cars? Oh, yeah. It was. Do you know what, it, what was it? Uh, Nothing, but I had no idea what was in okay. the box car. But it was a short, it wasn't a big long one. All right. It was a few, yeah, and had it lit up just as I pulled up because I was saying, blow up, blow up, why doesn't that thing blow up? And I said, well, I got to get out of here. And that's when I pulled up, and that's the time that it blew. 
Yeah. So how were it, you liberated? Uh, Patton came through on April the 29th. Um, uh, I was at Mooseburg. Mooseburg was a very, very, very large camp, extremely large. And the Russians were coming in from the east, Americans were coming in from the west, and they were getting closer and closer to Berlin. And they just kept coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. And they kept taking camps that were out here and they would put you on a forced march. Matter of fact, we walked for two weeks to get down to Mooseburg. Mooseburg was 30 kilometers north of Munich, Germany. And it made you walk all that way? Oh yeah, two weeks we walked. Did you have shoes and boots? Mm -hmm. How was oh, the weather? Oh, thank God I had, yeah. How was the weather? Was that winter time or? No, uh, <clears throat> I went down in March. Okay. Yeah, and it was. Oh, well, we had a few cool evenings, but I mean, it didn't matter. I mean, the weather was fairly decent. And. Uh, mm. So they, they marched you two weeks down to Mooseburg. Yeah, and, uh, and they were bringing in a lot of prisoners from other prison camps into Mooseburg. And I don't know the exact number, but they talk about Mooseburg had thousands of prisoners because they were dumping them all there as they kept moving in. And we knew that, and after we got into Mooseburg, uh, I was in Mooseburg for approximately uh, two weeks. And towards the latter part of those two weeks, we could hear the shooting and whatnot. And we knew that they were getting close. And we knew approximately where they were, you know, where the Americans and the Russians were. And we knew how fast they were advancing. And we knew it was just a matter of days. Matter of days. And I knew it, and even the Germans knew it. As a matter of fact, my interrogator even told me, he said, well, the war's almost over. And he says, don't try to escape, because they will shoot you. And he says, go there and just do your time as a POW. Don't try to escape. He says in four or five months, you'll probably be liberated. Well, it wasn't four or five months. It only took a few months. So uh, before the soldiers, before our, our soldiers came in, did the Germans leave the camp? Or did oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, that morning, we knew that they were very close. And the German soldiers, they all got up. And we had the Luftwaffe. Uh, guarding us. Luftwaffe was the German Air Force. Oh uh, yeah, the flight. They were like the like the Army Air Corps, mm -hmm. and uh, they got. Uh, they were there up and early. They got in formation, and they were waving at us, and we were waving at, at them and saying, and they're saying, "Good luck to you." We're saying, "Well, no, good luck to you." You know, we got it made. And, and you know, I mean, the war was uh, practically over, and they were laughing and whatnot, and waving at all the guys as they went marching out of the camp. Uh, no. <laughs> so you were happy to see some of your oh, fellow soldiers. Yeah. Oh boy! Now, did you ever meet Patton? Oh no. And uh, it's interesting when Patton came in. You know, Patton was a big guy. Patton was about six foot two. A big man, tall man. You know how he wore his, his guns pistols and all. And he he had to know that this huge prison camp was here, cause they knocked down you know the fence and whatnot to come into it. And uh, so he had all these tanks. And there's one, two. I think he, there was a second tank. And then he was here in his Jeep behind the second tank, I remember. And then he just had a string of tanks, you know, following them. So they come in and they park there after they knocked down, you know, the barbed wire and whatnot. And they came into the prison grounds. 
and uh, Patton was standing on the hood of his tank. And I happened to, just by luck, was down pretty close. So I was reasonably close to it. But we had, if you were to look back, we had just thousands of guys that were there. And they're all howling and screaming. And so here he is up on the hood. And probably the guy waiting in the back probably couldn't even see him. You know, because he wasn't up high enough. Uh -huh. yeah. But he was there, and I could see him. And he was standing there with them guns on. And it's interesting, because those boots were spotless. And I said, now he knew doggone well he was going to come into this prison camp. <laughs> so he come in, he was dressed. Breach his own boots was spotless. His jacket, his helmet, and he's standing there with his hands on his hip and his two six shooters on the side. And I can't say all of the language because there's a lady present, uh -huh. but I'll just say this. That dash, 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 and I'm dash, 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 I'm going to find that dash, dash, dash. He's running, but I'll catch up with him. And when I catch that dash, 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 I know where he is someplace up there in the Berlin, and we'll find him up there. And when I do, I'm going to take that dash, 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 and I'm going to do this to this. <laughs> and, oh, and then every time he say that, the old guys are just, yay, Pat, <laughs> yay, Pat, howling, screaming, and he just loves it. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, he says, well, he only stayed there about five minutes or so. He says, well, I'm on my way. He says, I'll be in Berlin in five days. Well, he never got to Berlin because they stopped him and they allowed the Russians yeah. to come into Berlin, which yeah. was the biggest mistake we ever made. Well, I think he wanted to go on into uh, Russia. Yeah. He, he, he didn't like the Russians. Well, he had enough of an army to do it then. Yeah. Because we had the army. and the, But the Russians, uh, you know, they fought for what more than two years, the, the, you know, the Germans before, before the Germans started retreating back because the war was yeah. getting so tight. And uh, so when you got liberated, that was on April the 29th when he came into the camp. So wh where did you go from there? Okay, well it's interesting because they repaired the fence. <laughs> And they said, it done on me. We can't let all these POWs go running around. We got thousands of guys here. He said, we got a war to fight. So they rounded up all the guys, you know, because they were just running this all over the place. I don't know even if they even caught or got all of them. But they got as many as they could back into the camp. They put the fence back up and said, you guys got to stay here. Now, we'll get you out of here within the next two or three days or so. But you got to work with us now. Stay here and don't go wandering off because there's still a lot of German soldiers that are wandering around out there. Uh -huh. And he says, uh, you want to get yourself dead, you know, killed at the last minute. And you don't want that. So we stayed in the camp. We stayed in the POW camp for five days. And they had, and of course we had priority. And they were bringing in trucks and trucks and hauling guys out, you know, as fast as they would bring in trucks and get them loaded. They would take a load out. And, uh, and there was an airstrip not that far down. They take them down to the airstrip. They just had lines of C-47s okay. parked down there. And they would bring them in, load up a service. As fast as they bring them in, they load up a, a C-47. He was gone. And they'd take them up to Camp Lucky Strike. That was all the way up into, uh, again, here I am with names. Uh, it's a port that I that we came out of France on, big port. And if I said it, you would probably recognize it. Lahore? Uh, no. Uh, it, nope, it, it wasn't Lahore, it was, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of it. But I will, I bet, before you leave. <clears throat> and they had, <clears throat> C-47s, they were taking guys, you know, by 
the loads, loading them up on C-47s, and the C-47s were taking them out. Then when you got to this French port, uh, did you then get uh, transported back to the States by yeah. a plane or no, boat? No, I stayed, I stayed in that, on that French base, I stayed on that base for almost five weeks. Because, Why is that? Uh, because I was liberated uh, on uh, on June the fourth, June fifth. Geez, I don't I don't know how in the world I could ever forget that date. I think it was June fifth. Why were you there for another five weeks? Yeah. Wait a minute. I'm I'm getting my date screwed up because. Uh, I went down. I went down on the fourteenth uh, of April. Wound up in Nuremberg. I stayed in Nuremberg for a total of just about two weeks. We walked for another two weeks. All in May, I got down to down to Mooseburg. Uh, it was now late in May. Then I stayed in Mooseburg for just about two or three weeks because Patton came through our camp, I think it was June the 5th. Okay. Yeah. And then I stayed, uh, we stayed there in the camp for about four or five days uh, before I got out and time I got up to Lucky Strike. Uh, and then from Lucky Strike, they, uh, uh, they uh, loaded us on boats. It only took us nine, ten days to come home. <laughs> on as, a, a as, ship. A, as opposed to 32. Yeah, 32 <laughs> days with the whole convoy. Of course, then you know. And uh, got home. Where'd you come back to? New York or Boston? Or? No, I came back to Camp Lucky Strike. It was in uh, Camp Lucky Strike. Geez, I'm having trouble with. Uh, with locations. Ordinarily, I, I just spit out these words. Uh, but it was in, it was fairly close to the port that I departed from. Mm. And they had a great big port there. B Baltimore? It was, no, it was a little further south. It was in one of the Carolinas. Oh, Charles, that, Charleston, South Carolina? There. Charleston? No, it wasn't Charleston. But it was down in that area. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. So, uh, w when you got back to the yeah. States, how long were you at that port before you went somewhere else? Well, you know, it's interesting because they were bringing all these guys out there and they were prioritizing people, you know, because they had emptied not only a lot of POW camps, but there were hospitals and others that they've. Uh, emptied the prisoners out of. And uh, so you wait there and you got an assignment on a ship. And uh, every day they were talking about, well, they're expecting, you know, 12 ships in the day. And, was it? and they had the whole list of guys. You knew right where you were. Mm. And uh, they would load up those 12 gone. But I was there, my God. Uh, I, I, I didn't get home until, uh, until in the latter part of July. When home, was that in Minnesota? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I came right back to the port that I had departed from and <coughs> <coughs> Was there, and I was there for just two days, and uh, and then I was on my way home. But they were processing you just as fast as they could to get you out. But there were thousands of guys, you know, that they were trying to get out of there and get back home. And every POW got a 60-day leave. And my brother, who had been hurt, he had already been sent back home, but he was in a hospital, and I and I was there, 
and he had gotten out of the hospital, not permanently, but they gave him X number of days out, something like 50, 60, 70 days, things, but he had to go back because he was still on crutches and whatnot, uh -huh. and he got home one day before I did. Okay. Yeah. But he had been transferred all the way back to a hospital back in Minneapolis, back up to Fort Snelling. And now your folks have been told you were missing in action. Oh, yeah. When were they ever told that you were still alive? You know what? Uh, hey, Marsha? Uh, Got a big question. Got a question. You know all those telegrams and things you got? You know, you got the one telegram that told me I was missing in action. Told your parents. Yeah. Was there any other telegrams that said that I was on my way home or anything? I, I, I don't there think there were telegrams that both went to your parents and why it was would break your heart is because both of their sons were possibly dead. Okay, but that's it. No right. others. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I thought it was. You know, I mean, we did a fairly short, because one was missing in action and one was severely wounded and so you know that was the moment yeah. of you know if you could imagine having two sons both so did you contact them before you came home did they yeah. as a matter of fact uh, as a matter of fact I, I got in a phone call to them after i got off the boat but i was only off the boat uh it only took them a couple of days to process I me mean, the processes after he got off the boat and I was on a train on my way to Minneapolis. Who'd you talk to on the phone, your mom or dad? No, all I did was just left, uh, I had called and I left a message <laughs> there that I was, that I was back in the States. Oh. And, uh, and my brother got home, like I said, the day before I did, and, and he was still using a crutch. And then I came home, uh, I was in great shape. I had lost some weight, a lot of weight. Uh, but other than that, uh, I was uh, thin as a rail bef before I even you know, became a POW. But it only took us, what did I say, nine, it took nine or 10 days to come back home. And then they processed you immediately. They gave you clothes, a couple of uniforms, and a, and a couple of pairs of fatigues. He gave you a bag, you know, uh -huh. to carry the stuff in. And I had my bag and whatnot, had my train ticket, had a 60-day leave, and I'm on my way home. So It took did me just about two days of travel. I traveled from here to Chicago, then from there to Chicago, then from Chicago to Minneapolis. Do you remember what rail line you, t you were on? It was the... The, the New York Central, the Penn C, or No. We had two big airlines. We had Northwestern, which was running out of Minneapolis, and then we had another one uh, that was a little smaller than Northwestern. I was on the smaller airline, uh, but they were they were both had the fancy. I can remember the trains were starting to get these fancy engines, not the great big ones with all of the... The, the steam in, you were you were coming back on diesel train instead of a, uh, a coal burner? Yeah, it was not a coal burner. The whole train had diesel, diesel. engines. Diesel, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, uh, did you ever get married? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact... Uh, and who did you get married to? Matter of fact, uh, I, I didn't get married until I was married in 1950. Uh, I was stationed up at Lockburn and uh, met a girl uh, who lived in Columbus. So she she is, uh, has now passed, uh, oh, geez, a long time ago. And uh, no, I had uh, two daughters. The oldest daughter uh, is down in uh, Savannah, Georgia, Karen, and then the other daughter, uh, she was born with hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus, I don't know uh -huh. which pronunciation, 
and uh, we didn't discover it until she was just about four months old and they operated on her when she was almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So and it looked so funny, this little baby was on his, uh, I was down in uh, Houston, Texas and I took her down to San Antonio where they had a great big general hospital there and uh, my wife and I, so she, they kept her there for about 10 days and they decided uh, to do the operation on her and I went down there and the wife stayed home with the other daughter and uh, up in Houston and uh, I was down in San Antonio for two or three days uh, and it was so funny, my goodness, uh, they had to operate on her because they discovered you know what was her problem was yeah was this which was a major surgery and uh she's only about four months old she's in that operating oh, room wow. from eight o'clock came out at one o'clock and these two big guy burly guy was pushing this you know table with this little body on this table <laughs> you know but i, I never will forget and they said well she she came out just fine the operation uh, so uh, she's going to have to stay here for about 10 days and then you can take her home. And uh, so I went back to Houston and then came back to San Antonio to pick her up and take her back up to Houston. And uh, did she live a normal life? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, she, uh, she was... Uh, permanently uh, crippled, uh, she never walked, okay. nothing. Uh, matter of fact, she did start talking when she was about 12, barely. And uh, her speech got a little better when she was 12. And, and during this time, she, she didn't even grow like a normal girl at all. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, it, it's sitting there when she was, uh, 12, 13, 14 years old, she was about the size of about a three-year-old. Oh. And she never got any bigger than that. Uh. And uh, of course she required, you know, 24 hour a day sure. care, and that was uh, interesting. And she lived, uh, and they figured she'd only lived no more than five years. She lived for 17 years, wow. eight months, and eight days. <laughs> And I had left Houston, was up in Columbus, uh, because that's where uh, my wife's mother was, mm -hmm. and they could help, you know, Take with uh, with Denise. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh, she was the cutest little thing, but, and she got, actually, she got fairly, you know, a verbal. Mm -hmm. uh, her vocabulary was still very limited. Uh, but, she called me, hey, dad, hey, dad. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Lock Lockbourne was in Columbus, wasn't it? Yeah, 18 miles south of Columbus. Yeah. Now, is Karen still living? Yes, Karen is in Savannah, Georgia. What's her, is she married? Uh, she was, she's now divorced. Uh, a matter of fact, they had a, geez, two great big wrestlers that was doing extremely well well down in uh, Savannah. Uh, they, they, when they first went down, uh, they were going back to school to get their master's degree. And uh, we were traveling and they got as far as Denver and George, uh, George liked to ski. So they said, well, let's stay in Denver for a while. We can we on to San Francisco later on because his grandfather was out in San Francisco. While well, they fell in love with uh, with with Denver, and uh, they were right on the outskirts, not the outskirts of Denver, but they're at one of the big resort areas. Uh, what are some of those big resort areas they had there? The big a Aspen. It wasn't Aspen. Uh, one of them that starts with a P. 
Price or Price? Uh, uh, I, I can't remember. Anyway, they stayed there, and then they were working there. Because uh, they were looking for bartenders and yaki yai. And what they did is they got, they did a smart thing. They, they came to Columbus, and they were going to go out to San Francisco and go to graduate school. So, uh, so while they were in uh, Columbus, what they did is they both went to OSU, the night school, and took courses and bar mixing. <laughs> up at OSU, right. they they both had their baccalaureate degree, uh -huh. and if they got that, and they said, "Well, we better get this because it's going to have to be a lot of part-time work, you know." And after that, they'll be in bars and so yeah. forth. A lot of part-time work because uh, she thought that she might go back to school too. So they started heading west, and they got out to Denver. Colorado, and that is as far west as they got. They got a couple of good jobs there, and then some friends of theirs was down in, uh, was down in, uh, oh my goodness, what am I doing with names today? It's really terrible. Uh, great big golfing community, which is which is just 40 miles from Charleston in South Carolina. Mm. Uh, uh, Big golf in there, but nevertheless, they came, that's Hilton, where they were going to, Hilton, and that's where they went to. Hilton Head? Hilton Head? Yeah, Hilton Head. Well, okay. Trying to do that. And as well as I know Hilton Head, I only went to Hilton Head for something like 16 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they went down there and they're working on uh, Hilton Head, both of them had jobs down on Hilton Head. And uh, where they lived at, in the apartments up there, uh, there were a number of people, all the people that worked on Hilton Head all had one of those condos and things right there on uh, Hilton Head. And I would drive down to Hilton Head and uh, stay there you know, two or three weeks at a time because I loved golf. And, uh, and they finally left and went down to Savannah. And they went down to Savannah and uh, George bought, they saved up the money so he could buy a restaurant down in Savannah. They found a nice restaurant for sale. Mm -hmm. So they got that restaurant, did extremely well, got another restaurant, and they had the two restaurants going. And they did that for, my God, uh, eight, nine, ten years or so, and then they agreed to disagree. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of the restaurant business. And George left, and uh, he's on a little island right now off of, uh, here I am with names again, uh, just up north of... See on Kiowa Island? Kiowa? I can't remember, and I haven't seen him since he since he's been up there working. But nevertheless, they decided to they sold the restaurants, and uh, she stayed in Savannah. They had a house in Savannah. She stayed uh, in Savannah, and he left and, and uh, went up north, not that far north, but he's working on a island out there again, bartending and whatnot. Is Karen still living? Uh, oh yes, Karen is. Uh, How old's Karen now? Yeah, Karen is still. She's not married and did, did not remarry, and uh, she's living there. Loves it. And is she uh, about seventy. Yeah. Yeah. She have any children? Yeah, no children. Okay. Yeah. Now, what was your first wife's name? Uh, Maxine. Okay. What was her maiden name? Gilmore. Kilbore? Gilmore. Gilmore. G-I-L-M-O-R-E. Uh, where'd yeah. you meet her? Uh, she, uh, we lived, uh, we lived in Columbus, Ohio. That's where, uh, that's where she was born in Columbus. Uh, her mom and dad was from down in southern Ohio. 
but they relocated up to Columbus. And uh, when I met her, she was living in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. And uh, we were married in Columbus. And uh, we she? lived in Columbus, oh my God, for some time. And then, uh, and then we agreed to disagree. And I went up in North Columbus and uh, had an apartment and then and then I had a, then I bought a, a condo on <clears throat> right off of Highway 70 that goes from Columbus down to Dayton. <coughs> and well, I was born in Columbus. Uh, where did you live when you were living in Columbus? Uh, two places. At first, uh, I was living on on the east side of uh, of Columbus. That's where I lived. And what in the world was on um, was that street? Was that in Bexley area? I I was on. Do you know Fifth Avenue? Yeah. Okay, you go up Fifth Avenue to Nelson Road. Okay. And there was three little houses that was very very close to lived into a little park way. All right. And that's where I lived. That's where we lived. <coughs> And uh, so I finally sold that place, and I went up 161. I mean, not 161. What was Fifth Avenue went north, all the way up close to 161. Okay. And I was just about uh, half a mile, maybe three quarters of a mile, south of 161, just off of. Uh, no, it wasn't Fifth Avenue. What in the world was that street? It was uh, Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue goes east, east and, and west. Yeah, and then there was another highway that went north and south, and I'm trying to think of the name of it, because it went right across Fifth Avenue. Carl Road. Uh, 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 High Street was a main... No, no. No, no, I was east of that. Okay. And I was east of Broad Street, you know. Okay. And, uh, well, and of course, well north. Were you in the Worthington, Ohio area? No. That's 161 goes through Worthington. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Now, 161 went through. I was well west of it, two okay. or three miles. And I was north of Columbus area. And oh, I'm trying to think of this doggone big highway that I used to take. I can't even remember it now. But nevertheless, so uh, that's where I uh -huh. lived uh, uh, until we agreed to disagree. And I had a, a oh, there's a beautiful piece of land. I bought an acre of land up there and built, oh, a beautiful home up there. And uh, so she said, uh, uh, I want the piece of land. I want the home. Yeah, you know, just keep talking. And I want this, and I want that, and okay, okay. And after she was all through talking, I said, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so we went, so yeah. we went to the courts. Okay. And the, the marriage, and I had a lawyer. On the OU, I got my bachelor's. Uh, well, I almost had my bachelor's degree while I was in the military. I needed one course, and uh, I was at Lockbourne, so I enrolled uh, in school down in, uh, well, just for about 40, 40, 40 some miles south, down to Athens, Athens Ohio. That's Ohio University. And, uh, and there is where I finished up. I took, I needed two courses, two math courses. I took eight hours with them, and that took me a year. When, when did you get your BS? Oh, I got it in June of 1940. Let me see, what day did I retire? I retired in June of, how long have I been retired down here? Uh, let me go back here. And, uh, <laughs> oh boy, I'm not always this bad. <laughs> well, I'm a little better this, well, at well, times. Well, after you got your BS from OU, uh, yeah. 
then you went uh, then to I went with, uh, you went then I went with Columbus Tech, and I was the vice president of Columbus Technical what was uh, that? Institute, which came Columbus Technical College okay. in Columbus, Ohio. No, but you also went to Ohio State and got a master's, didn't you? Oh yeah, and then and then that was after I got the job with them. But I got my bachelor's degree on the day after I retired. So that was in uh, oh. uh, was in forty five, nineteen forty, nineteen nineteen sixty five. I'm sorry. Yeah, 1965. Yeah, you had a voluntary retirement. 1964 or 65. According to your DD-214, you uh, had a voluntary retirement on May 31, 2000, uh, in 1965. Yeah, 1965 is when I left. I, and uh, your last year? I, I was 40, 40 years old. I had made lieutenant colonel. and. Uh, I said, there's more to life than pushing a handful of throttles flying airplanes. <laughs> and you, you were in the uh, air refueling wing of SAC? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, so you, re you retired from that, and then uh, what, what's the last work that you've done? What was that? What was the last work that you ever did before you totally retired from work? Oh, oh the last work I did. Well, I retired from the military, yeah. and uh, then I went with uh, Columbus Technical College, okay. and I was the vice president down, at, and then down how, at Columbus Technical. How long did you do that? Well, I did that after I retired, so it wouldn't, none of that. Right. This is just, you know. Yeah, but how, long, how long were you the, uh, okay, at Columbus I Tech? Okay, I retired in Ohio State. I was with him for 21 years. And they allowed me to buy in 10 years of my service. Okay. So I retired with 32 years of service uh, under the State Teachers Retirement Association. And uh, Marcia, at the time, she was the vice president over at Clark State Community College in Springfield, now, Ohio. Who, who is Marcia? That's my wife. Okay. Yeah. And when did you and Marcia get married? Oh my God! July July seventh. Yeah, I think Sounds it was. Good. How did you know that date? You're right. As a matter of fact, she's always on my case because I always forget the date. You know. Yeah, I forget mine too. But uh, okay, uh, you but were. See, but that was after you know she started looking for a for a, uh, you know, presidency, and uh, she finally got the job up at, uh, in Fremont, o Ohio, and uh, she was the president there. Oh, good. Yeah, for 10 years, and then she retired. Uh, and that was, my, my God, uh, she went with them in 2003, and retired in 2012, okay. I, I think. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm looking at your DD-214 and it says that you served in Korea? Yeah, well, no, uh, I, well, I spent a lot of time over, over, over in Korea, but I was flying back and forth between Korea and and Japan, as you know, the war was going on. So I set up a big radar system. And, and then I didn't go over as a fighter pilot, even though I was current in all of the jets and everything. And I even volunteered to go to Korea in the, in the 50. And uh, my commander in the Far East Air Material Command, command said, no, he says, I need you here. So he went and let me volunteer. But I used to fly over, excuse me, fly over to Korea carrying critical parts. Fly the C-47 over to Korea, you know, dump all the parts. Uh-huh. And uh, 
and they were maintaining. Uh, how, I, I helped put in a big radar system up in the K-16, and that was up in uh, Seoul. All right. Now, yeah. uh, how, long were you, how long were you over there in well, Korea no, and Japan? I was just back and forth. Yeah, but how long were you doing that? Korea oh, and Japan? Oh, I did that every, every I, I, I went to Korea and in July, uh, June of 1950, the war started and I stayed there until uh, December of 1952. And uh, of course, the war was in was over then. It had just ended, and that is when I came home from the Far East. That was about '53, wasn't it? 50? Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, I I left right at the end of '52. Uh huh. I got back home. Yeah, in January of '53. Uh, so you volunteered to be a fighter pilot over there. Oh yeah. Oh, well, oh, I was. Oh, I was flying in the when I was in FEMCOM, I was flying all of the fighters. Uh, maybe you know, if you can't repair it at your home base, then you send it up to the depot, and we repair it because we could do everything at the depot, and that was at Tachikawa. But everything that came into the depot, airplane wise, had to be test flown before we were sending it back to the squadron. Sure. While Major Kelly was running flight tests, so I went down to see him one day. I said, uh, Kelly, uh, do you need any help down here? He says, Are you volunteering to help me flight test? I said, Yeah. I said, You're flying all these airplanes? I said, I, uh, I flew 51s in the war and whatnot. I, 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 said, I said, I'm not jet qualified. Yeah, he said, well, you fly all the 51, since I do have a bunch of them, that will leave me time to fly all of the jets, F-80s, F-84s, F-86s, F-94s. And then he said, the first time that I get a jet trainer, I'll check out the jets, and, and then you can fly all the jets. So I'm flying, and uh, he called me, and I was right across the street from him in my office, and I had the... Uh, and then I was working in ground radar, and uh, so uh, I, I go bump, I got go beep up and over there, and so he and I got in this little jet trainer. He, I'm in the front seat, he's in the back. We go up and act silly for about 20, 30 minutes. Came back in, and he shot a touch and go where you just come in. You know, you land the airplane, then you give it the throttle, uh -huh. take back off, and then I took there, I landed. It's good landing, he says, that's good enough, let's stop the aircraft. So I stopped it and we went in and uh, he said, uh, and we logged, I think something like 30, 35 minutes. So the next day he calls me, he says, hey, he says, I got a F-80, it's gotta be test flown. He says, are you ready to fly it? I said, well, if you wanna call me a flight test pilot with only 30 minutes in the air in, in an airplane, <laughs> in a jet airplane and then fly. He said, ah, you got enough. So I went over and jumped in the airplane and now I'm flying F-80s. And, <laughs> and then I kept flying. He would get in 84s. Hey, here, I got some 84s out here and whatnot. Uh, okay, you, you, when you get one ready, give me a call and I'll come out and fly it. <laughs> so I was helping him in flight test. Uh -huh. And then I did that up until the time that we were in the bay, and, theme, and the Forest Air Material Command went around the base. We had Kissera Zoo. All the aircraft would come in for the war on carriers, and they would offload them, put them on barges, come over to Kissera Zoo uh, of, of the bay uh, of uh, Japan. When something like this, Japan was up here, and Kissera Zoo was on the other side of the bay, but it all belonged to uh, Fire East Air Material Air Command. And I got an assignment, and they needed somebody to go over uh, uh, the health flight, uh, uh, test fly all of the aircraft that they were bringing in by boat. So I volunteered for it. The CEO said, Harold, I understand uh, 
No, he called me Lieutenant Brown. He says, I understand that you're volunteering to go with the kids to resume. I said, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, sir. I can fly all of the aircraft, all the aircraft of the guys coming in, you know, to uh, fight the war and whatnot over in the Korea. I said, for the next you know, two or three months, it's great. It was only for just a, a, a short period of time. Yeah. So he says, well, do you know uh, Major Sellers? I said, no, sir. He says, nobody wants this job but you because <laughs> they don't want to work for Major Sellers. I said, I can work with anybody. You know, I said, I'm volunteer. I said, I will go. So he says, okay. He says, uh, it'll only take something like six days. So they originally sent me down for just 60 days temporary duty. I was flying all the aircraft. I was only checked out in the 80s. 84 come in, a bunch of home sellers. We get them ready to go to be test flown. They would offload them, bring them over, and we would run them through our place, put in the engines, tab the engines and whatnot, get the aircraft all ready to go. So sellers, all right, you know how to fly this the end is damn 84. I said, no, but I've never flown 84. Well, there's one that's got to be test flown. You just learn how to fly it. It's yours <laughs> to fly, you know. All right. Hell, it didn't make any difference to me, you know. I have to be alone anyway in the aircraft. So I would get with the flight chief, who was really sharp. And I'd go over the, I'd get in the cockpit, and I'd say, okay, let's go over everything in this cockpit. You tell me how it all works. Well, this is this, this is this, then. You know, cop pits are cop pits. Yeah. And small changes. He said, this is such and such. It's okay. I got it. That's good enough. I fired it up. Boom. <laughs> I take off. Now I'm qualified in F-84. Next thing I know, F-86 or something. F-86. You ever fly an F-86? Nope. I'm never flown an F-86. Well, there's, we got 30 of them. It's got to be flown. The first one's ready to go. Here I go. I'll fly, I'll fly all the F-86s. So this is what I did. And, and you uh, loved every oh minute of it. Oh my God, oh my God, I got a chance. I was current, at one time I was current in 12 different aircraft because the Army had their five airplanes that they were repairing in, in the same place in Kisser Zoo. And they had to be test flown. So the Army, we would put them together and we would test fly out and turn them over to the Army. And we had L5s, L16s, L17s, L19s, L20s. I flew all five of them, you know. And we would get them ready and whatnot. I'd take them up for 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes or so. It's okay. Come in, land in. It's your airplane. And they'd take it. <laughs> so, now, did you test fly any that you had a problem with? Oh, oh yeah, I, I sometimes had problems. There were times when, uh, well, for example, I, I remember one day I was up on, and, and an old 50, some 51s came over. They had to be test flown, and, and sellers didn't want to be bothered with 51s, and I said, well, I'll fly them. And uh, the whole throttle quadrant, I gave it the throttle and whatnot, and took off fine. I'm flying, finally, boom, the whole throttle quadrant, boom comes crashing off of the left side. And I said, what in the world? You know, so here I am, the, the throttle trying to, you know, yeah. which has cables to the engine and whatnot, sure. control the engine and whatnot. So I called down, I said, damn it. I said, the whole throttle quadrant came off this thing. He said, ah, you don't need no, you don't need no damn engine, uh, throttle quadrant anyway. He said, fly it without. I said, yeah, but I got to cut the, he says, fly it on over when you're in range or when you've come. He says, cut the engine and dead stick if there's no problem, you know. <laughs> I said, okay, so I came in, you know, I, I can't do anything with the throttle. So I came down one night and got over the wrong way, broke. My aircraft came around when I got around to this side and I had the wrong way made. I reached up and hit the switch and cut off the engine. And, and just came bombing around and whatnot and dead sticking and made a good landing, just a smooth boom boom and whatnot. 
And there it was, and they had to tow me off of the runway because you know, the uh, because I had to shut the engine down completely because there's no way that I could control it. Yeah. So there were a few little <laughs> little things like that that kind of happened occasionally. So but for the most part. So yeah. dead sticking is when you have to turn the engine off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was a dead stick yeah. landing. Is what right. we call <laughs> no engine. <laughs> But well, you have had quite a career. Oh, yeah, I was really lucky. And then I got, you know, over there, uh, uh, in that book, it would talk about all the aircraft that I've flown. Mm -hmm. And I think there's 19 or 20 different aircraft, which was, was most unusual. These guys going into the military now, uh, They'll fly the F-35, and that's probably the only aircraft they'll fly. They may fly, I fly another one, but I doubt it. And they'll fly that whole aircraft for their whole career, uh -huh. you know, unless they are reassigned to an outfit that's got a different airplane. So, yeah. So you don't fly more than two or three airplanes usually. But if you're lucky, like I was lucky, uh, you fly a whole lot of airplanes. So now, as far as medals and stuff, you got an air medal with two oak leaves? Yeah. Now, what, what were the oak leaves about? Well, oak leaf, rather than give you another medal, they give you an oak leaf cluster. And what's that for? Just a period of time, or did you do something special to get that? No. Oh, why did I get, why did I get the air medal? No, I got, got at the air medal primarily for flying uh, for flying missions. But the two oak leaves is on top of just the regular air medal. Yeah, well, they give it to you, but X number of missions you okay. fly, and they give you an air medal, you know, because I flew X number of missions. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, uh, if I had not been shot down, I, I'm certain that I, I would have gotten a DFC, which I didn't get, which breaks my heart, I was a POW instead. But for those 30 missions, after the first 15 missions, I got the air medal. And then I picked up, uh, after I got up to 25 missions, they gave me the FERC 06 cluster. Then the 30 missions, they gave me the second, second one. one. And if you hadn't gotten shot down, you would have gotten what? The distinguished? Oh, I was hoping that I'd to get a distinguished flying cross. That's the, that's the one medal I really wanted. But I didn't get it. But I'm certain that Major Campbell would have put me in for uh -huh. a distinguished flying cross. Well, what are some of the other ribbons you have there? All these are, all these are primarily service. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the one on the bottom, what's that? I, I don't even, I, I don't, you know how I keep track of these things? I'll, I'll be right back. I'll, I'll uh, show uh, you. Take your mic off. Huh? Take it, uh, unhook your. Hey, uh, 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 and hey, Marsh. That cord, honey, what? And this is going a little bit long. There's a cord there, sweetie. <laughs> I, oh, you were you just oh, leaving? She was getting ready to I do was walk. getting the mail. Oh, you know, you know the drawer that's got all of my junk in it. Oh, I thought you were going to sign a book for it. Oh well, that too, I which I had forgotten that. about. We can pull it open and bring me out one of those the U.S. Air Force manuals. They're in the stack right there. Oh. Well, while she's doing that, uh, yeah. you got a prisoner of war medal. Yeah. And you just yeah. have a, a, that is, a number of services. That is this one. Okay. But these are a variety of services, and I, I can't keep track of them. Now, and, you said you said you. And this form here, what's that, my 214? Uh, right here is your DD-214. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's... Okay. Now, um, yeah. That is probably the most useless. <laughs> it, it, it should be the best. 
But there's so much stuff that is left off of that, it isn't funny. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Is this what you meant? Yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> you got a lot of so that. this is how I keep track of them, because I don't know them all. But you're talking about the names of them? American, American Campaign. Yeah. And American Defense. Air Force Achievement Medal, mm -hmm. World War II Victory Medal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, everything has got a circle around it, is what I'm wondering. Prisoner of War, uh, European, African, Middle Eastern Campaign, mm -hmm. Korean Service Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Air Force Longevity Service Award Ribbon, yeah. Armed Forces Reserve Medal, uh, United Nations Service Medal. Hmm. Tell you, you've got more medals than uh, than. Uh, oh, I got a few, not that many. <laughs> and there, you 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 look at these generals. You notice they got medals from here all the way up to yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh. <clears throat> all right. Uh, let's see in. Uh, we talked about your World War II, but then uh, you were Barksdale Air Force Base, uh, June 46 to August 46. Uh, oh. That was an instructor's course. Yeah, that is where I went to the Central Instrument Instructor School. Then Kessler Air Force Base of Mississippi, August of 49 to June of 50, radar tech electronics yeah, that course. Was, yeah. Then James well, Electronics Officer School. It was a year long, almost six James, hours a day. James Conley Air Force Base in Texas, March '56 uh -huh. to October '56. Uh, A F F S P L T A O B training. Oh, in order to be an aircraft commander on a, a B-47. LeMay said, you got to be triple rated. Uh, so I had to go back to school and get my navigator bombardier wings. So I'm triple rated. Pilot, navigator, bombardier. Wow. So that was the requirement. And you won't find, <coughs> you won't find too many people today who are triple rated. Yeah. I don't, I don't doubt that. And uh, your permanent grade lieutenant colonel, mm. that's what you retired yeah. as, the lieutenant uh -huh. colonel. That is, uh, that is pretty super. Uh, well, we got a we got a picture here of you. And, and you know what? And where do you know where that was taken? Absolutely. This was I had just come back from overseas. I was 21 years old. Can you see? Kind of got it. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're 21. I was 21 years old, and that was in that summer. I turned 22 in August. That was in June or July, whenever it was. I came back, uh, you know, after I was a POW. Yeah. All this. Yeah. Yeah. And. I had only been home. You know how skinny I am? Yeah. <laughs> I was skinny. But. Oh, is this taken? Is this, where is this taken? Is this a, This is in Minneapolis. Minneapolis, okay. Yeah. Well, I bet your mom and dad were just yeah. tickled to death to see you after all those oh, telegrams yeah. that you Let were missing in action. Here. Uh, I was looking up there to see. Well, I've got. Do you go to any more reunions? Oh, we used to have, I, I used to go to reunions every year. Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated now. And, and where would they have those reunions? And they only have one once a year. And it's either the West Coast, at the center, someplace, or the East Coast. They got 50 chapters, which makes up the total organization and all of the states. So they are either here, here, or here, and then they rotate here in the middle of the country on the eastern side of the, of the country. Now, 
he told me that there's only seven of you air pilots left of the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes. Uh, do you keep in touch with any of them? Only with a few of them. There's uh, a, a very dear friend, Brigadier General uh, Chuck McGee, uh, a very dear friend. He just died uh, 102. He died about three weeks ago. Uh. He was out in Maryland. And then I live here. There's, there are three others. Two of them are up in Detroit, and the other one is down in Sarasota, Florida. And then the other two are, are guys that I knew them, but they, but I didn't know them overseas, and I'd never met them, you know. Yeah. So what interaction did you ever have with Davis? Oh, well, he was our commanding officer. And I stayed as far away from him as possible because if I had to go up to see him, it's only because I'm in trouble. So, no, but, but he was a fairly nice guy. And the commanding officer, you know, you only see him occasionally. Now, he was your commanding officer over at Ramatelli? Yep, he was there at Ramatelli, and we were up at Lockbourne. He was the commanding officer. All right. We were at Lockbourne. And, uh, and then we were integrated and we went to the four winds. Mary, uh, my wife Mary is our camera person today. Do you have any questions uh, that you'd like to? I've just enjoyed every second of this. So, now, um, <laughs> when, you, when you were at Ramatelli, a couple of times you've used the nickname Brownie. Well, what, what was your usual name that they uh, used for you? H H, H H, yeah, Harold Haywood Brown, yeah, H yeah, H. There was two of us, Harold H Brown, that were all Tuskegee Airmen and all pilots. He was a twin engine pilot. Okay. So he never got overseas, and he was three classes behind me. Yeah, and his name was Harold Howard Brown. I was Harold Haywood Brown. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what, what, what would you say, if I asked you what your greatest experience was uh, as a Tuskegee Airman, what would you say? My present experience? Your, your, your best experience, your most... Oh, my best, oh my goodness, boy. <clears throat> what in the world would I say? That would be quite a question. I do remember uh, things like crashes and whatnot, but I don't want to remember those things. They were, I survived those things. Uh, well, what can, you didn't tell me about those. I, 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 I crash landed a, 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 a 51 on my way home. I, I had fuel exhaustion and I crash landed the airplane. I was trying to get back to a base. Back I to got Ram over the back bomb line. Back. Yeah, I got over the bomb line but I couldn't get back to the base because I had low, low fuel. So I was trying to get to a base before I ran out of fuel. Well, I had fuel exhaustion at 25,000 feet. So, yeah, that gets a little interesting too. When you sit up there and say, well, here, what are you going to do? Well, I'll decide when I get a little lower. So I looked over the side. I'm not going to do anything right now, but stay in this airplane. So I glided down, you know. and. Uh, I got down to 10,000 feet, so I said, okay, it's decision time. Either I'm gonna jump out of the airplane or else I'm gonna crash land it, one or the other. And sure luck, I spotted an old abandoned fighter strip and I had enough altitude, so I went over towards it and I'm losing altitude all the way. And by the time that I got to the strip, I was down to just about 3,000 feet. So I just made one great big circle and set it down, dead stick. Uh, and then wheels, oh, wheels down. Wheels. Oh no, I no no. I, I kept the wheels up because there was a four thousand foot strip, but there was something in the center that that made me have two thousand feet, two thousand feet, a great big ditch. Uh-huh, okay. So it would have been difficult yeah. landing it if I had 4,000. Yeah. So with 2,000, there ain't no way. 
and uh, I'm not going to line no wheels up. No. I'm going with no billing in. That's the safe way. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I build it in, there, you know, and then you adjust it because you don't have an engine, you know, and and you got to keep the airspeed up because the airplane is gliding. So you got a glide speed. Uh -huh. My glide speed was running close to 170 miles an hour, but now with no stick, I got to slow this airplane up down to 140 miles an hour when I'm coming down final, so I can land. It. So how do you slow it down? Huh? How do you slow it down? With difficulty. Well, how? And all I do is just got to level off a bit. And the more I level off, the more the airspeed will fall off. Okay. The airspeed only sees up to 170 because I'm coming down like this. Once I go this way, no engine, that airspeed starts falling off fast. So that becomes very tricky. Now I'm trying to get to the landing spot. I got to slow the airplane up. I can't land at 170. So it's nothing but judgment. And I'm judging the speed and whatnot and how fast the speed is going to fall as I bring the thing in the landing. Because before I touch down, I got to kill some of that speed. So I had to plan it so that I was here and I went level and I was almost off the ground, but I came up to the runway and like so, more more in a landing attitude. By the time that I got to the runway and whatnot, I was right down to the speed that I wanted and the near plane just set right down. Okay. Now, I'll be very honest. It takes an awful lot of skill to do that. Yeah. And that takes more skill than most people have. So there was a lot of luck involved. But I don't say luck. I say it was all skill. Right. My skill. <laughs> but you put 10 or 12 guys in the same situation, and no more than one of them is going to do it and get it right. And even he'll say, I had... I was the lucky guy out of 12 who did it. So when this comes to a stop, uh, you're, you're... Matter of fact, the ditch stopped me. Oh, the ditch? Yeah. I, I came right up to the ditch, hit the ditch, and nosed up into the ditch. The ditch was, was uh, pretty wide. Okay. Because I only had 2,000 feet on this side, a couple of thousand feet on this side. And I was estimating these distances. I didn't know exactly, but I know just about... Uh -huh. A 2,000 feet of runway looks like. So I landed here on my belly. It ran, and it was skinny, 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 and it hits the ditch, and it boom, goes up on the wheel. The airplane cracked right behind the cockpit. The airplane broke in two, so the rudder was right next to me. Because I was on my nose, and the, and my rudder was right here next to me. <laughs> the airplane broke in half. Jeez. And uh, and then I was fearful that it might go it this roll way. Roll over on I you. I might get trapped with some residual fuel if it somehow the catches on fire. You know, I could you I could die that. Could have been roasted. Yeah. So it, it teetered for a bit, and there. I said a little prayer to that airplane, don't you fall all the way over, <laughs> don't, don't do that, you know. And it teetered and blew and fell back this way. And I jumped out of it, of course, and got away from it. Because, you know, with the hot engine and what residual fuel that was there leaking around, there could have been a great big fire. Were, were you in Italy at that time? I was in uh, Italy. I had gotten... I had a dog fight with the enemy 262, me and my wingman. We were getting back home. Uh, we used more fuel than we should yeah. have. And then we got separated in the clouds. And there was a great big homer, and a big homer device, you can call it, and it will give you a heading. And my radios went out, which I didn't know at the time. And I, cause I had talked to him, but he was howling and screaming at me.
because when we broke out, out of the closet, I didn't see him around, but he called the homer, and the homer gave him a heading to the home base. So he's now heading for home base. I was just heading due south. I knew the home base was over here someplace, but I didn't know exactly where. So I run out of fuel. He just gets back to the base barely. But in the meantime, he is howling, screaming at me, Harold, the heading the home base is such and such. Well, I wasn't picking it up because my radio's been yeah. out. But he was screaming at me. If my radios had not been out, I would have known the heading and whatnot, the fastest way to get there, and I probably would have gotten there maybe with dry tanks, uh -huh. but at least I would have gotten all the way there. And if I have a little bit of fuel, I can land the airplane and save the airplane, you know. Well, what happened in the dogfight? Well, as far as I know, uh, the pilot is having an interview and it is being recorded. <laughs> He's doing the same thing I am. <laughs> yep. I shot like crazy. Bloop, 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 bloop. And he was gone. Bloop, bloop, bloop. But, I thought, but we followed him in because I knew that he's got a small fuel supply. Uh -huh. And I knew where the jet base was. So I told Rich, this guy has got to slow up. Because as as fast as he's flying, you can't land an airplane going 400 miles an yeah, hour. Yeah. So he's got to slow up. And when he slows up, we got him. Well, we didn't quite reach that point. And I said, Rich, we're wasting too much time. We got to get out of here. Yeah. I thought he would have slowed up by now because his base was just right up here, you know. And uh, so we broke it off. And that's when I started, you know, check and said, man, I'm low on fuel. And Rich, well, I only got so much fuel as you were going back. Then there was a big cloud cover and we got separated in the clouds. And then when we broke out of, out of the clouds, I didn't see Rich. And I was trying to call him, but my radio was had out. gone on out. Yep. And Rich was trying to call me because he had called the Homer, and the Homer had given him the fastest way to get the home base, the best direction. Well, well who came and rescued you? After you crashed land, who, who rescues you? Well, Fortunately, I, I could walk, and there was an old farmer that was here, and I knew a little Italian. Uh, and between speaking a little Italian and the two years Spanish that I took, we were able, and using my hand, he directed me to a roadway, and it was a main roadway. And I saw a roadway, so I knew I wasn't that far from one. So got my chute, and I go trudging out to the roadway, and before long, here comes a big old semi, military <laughs> truck, and I wave him down, <laughs> and he says, what are you doing out here? I said, I parked one up here, <laughs> you know. So can you take me to the nearest base? He says, well, we're going right back to where the, uh, uh, oh, what's the name of the base? Um, that's the material. But we went back to the base, so I went down to operations, and, uh, you know, I told him what had happened. I said, you got any phones? I better call home base. So I called home base and uh, told him wh where I was at and, you know, what I crashed landing the airplane. Uh -huh. And uh, so they said, the, uh, they said, you think you can get down to Naples? I said, well, I can hitchhike a ride down. They said, well, get down to Naples because there's where we had our rest and recuperation hotel at. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, and I was just a little bit south of Rome, going north south, but I was well, well east of Rome. So, the road that I was on, I stopped the guy, I got truck, no, I was in operations for a while, and I said, well, we don't have anything going that way, else we'll take you down. But he said, there will be, you know, trucks heading in that direction, Charlie, and sure enough, there was. Uh -huh. So I just jumped on one of the trucks and said, hey, can you get me to Naples? And he got me down to Naples. And then after I got into uh, 
Naples, interesting enough, uh, <clears throat> he had to go someplace. I said, well, you suppose you can get me up here to where I stay at? He said, well, yeah, I got time, you know. Yeah, I, I'll get you. So he drove me up to where our rest and recuperation hotel is at. Okay. So I come walking in, I said, Brown, what the hell are you doing here? You are not rest and recuperation. What the hell are you walking around carrying your parachute for? I said, guess where my airplane is? <laughs> you know, so I told him the whole story because I, I, my chute was good. I wasn't going to leave that chute there. Yeah. So I had the chute. I was carrying my chute with me. So I finally got there. And they said, well, the truck for, to get you for home base will be leaving in a couple of days. So I called home base and I said, I'm here at the rest and recuperation. They said, well, just stay there. And then Camel. My boss, Major Cameron, said, well, goofing off again, huh? <laughs> Just so you can get a couple of extra days of R&R. &R. I said, well, yeah, if you want. But I said, uh, you don't have an airplane. It tore in half when I belted it in. He said, well, the hell the airplane. We can always buy another airplane. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Did, uh, in any of your air combats, did you... Uh, Ever shoot any of the German planes down? I never got a victory. Didn't you? I shot at a few. Uh huh. Uh, but uh, I still feel that uh, I probably, I don't know. I, I think that sooner or later I would have gotten a victory or two. But did, did you lose any uh, of the bombers that you escorted? Uh, due to oh, air, airplane, fact, we lost bombers on seven missions. And was that from flak or was that from uh, uh, enemy aircraft? No, no, uh, no, no. Those were those were enemy aircraft. Seven of them. But that was the best record in fifteen. Yeah. No one was even close yeah. to it. Yeah. I mean, nah. The rest of them, yeah, flew on team missions. We lost many more aircraft than we did. Well. Your wife uh, gave us this book, Keep Your Airspeed Up, the story of a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, did, you, did you and your wife write this book? Mm -hmm. And that's about your career. That is wonderful. Yeah, uh, it has. Uh, that is wonderful. Let me see. Yeah. Yep. All right, is there anything that I, I've asked you so many questions? Uh, uh, I can't believe that I haven't covered about everything. Is there anything? I can't think of anything else. And me and my memory today, the way I, the way I'm having trouble you remembering. <laughs> thank you for this interview and your service. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. It's Wonderful.